One week ago, some of you know, those of, those of you who are involved in some of the workings of Faith Bible Seminary or know about it, that there was an accreditation team who came to perform its five-year evaluation of Faith Bible Seminary. Those of you who are in education know what a process like this entails. Before the team arrived, the FBS administrative team was preparing documentation on how FBS met the seminary standards or the accrediting standards. We started last year actually in preparing these documents. The document that we submitted was about 350 pages long with an additional supporting documentation of probably about 1,000 or more pages. Now, with a little hyperbole intended here, I'm about to give an illustration of what accreditation process is, is like. The, the rigorous accreditation process is like the invasive medical inspection procedures that those of you over 50, you know, you know these things to determine if you are healthy or not. You know what I mean, those of you who are over 50. If you're younger than 50, well, just enjoy your youth while you have it, okay? <laughs> I know we're going from the heights of the doxology to the depths of this illustration. I, I got it. Well, let's continue right now in the pit for just a little bit. You know, the difference between accreditation and those medical procedures is that at least in the medical procedure, you get a happy drug and you get to sleep through that invasive procedure. There was no happy drug administered to me during accreditation. A team of six individuals came and inspected every nook and cranny of FBS for 48 hours. And who oversees FBS? That would be me. And that means this, my life's work here at Faith Church, or at least in part, again, there's a little hyperbole here. My life's work is under the microscope for 48 hours, probing, prodding, questioning. And all the accreditation team, if they're listening here today, which I have no reason for them to think that they would be listening, but all of them perform their scrutinizing task with professionalism and kindness. Oh, but yet, folks, a kind and professional invasive procedure is still invasive. Okay? After the first day of scrutiny, having to produce more documentation, evidence, justification, I came home and I found myself thinking this. I don't want to go the next day. I mean, what are they going to find? What if they find that FBS has some kind of systemic weaknesses and we have to change some, some, some long-standing things we have, we have been doing? You know, I turn to the Lord and remember that this is what they're here for. They are here to probe and prod to see if FBS has weaknesses that will harm FBS and its constituents. And if they find weaknesses, folks, I need to know. I mean, I need to know. I need to set my face toward the scrutiny. Why should I be surprised at this? They are here to see if FBS is the real deal or not. When I got my heart right, the first thing the next morning is I got up and I met the team and I prayed for them to do their scrutiny job well. Okay. And although, that I had the, although they have the authority to do what I'm about to say anyway, I invited them at any point during that second day, all six of them to meet with me again, give me the third degree if they needed to. My last scheduled meeting that day was uh, ended at 1130. And I had heard that they were hoping to wrap up their work by 2.30 that afternoon. I thought that was a good sign. I remember going back to my office and thinking, 2.30, please come quickly, please come quickly. I don't want to be poked and scrutinized anymore. I actually had this thought. I just thought if I slipped out the building from now until 2.30, nobody will know where I am. And they cannot ask me any more questions. And then God reminded me, Brent, where can you hide? You're the CEO of FBS. Eventually, you're going to be found. <laughs> the scrutiny, the testing is inescapable. I mean, it was inescapable. This is the testing that is necessary to show forth that FBS is the real deal, or at least in the metaphor here, it's, 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 a, it's a testing process to show somebody, to give it a stamp of FBS is the real deal. 2.30 eventually came. I was, I was relieved that there was no more invasive procedures, at least with me. The next day, the team came and gave me the report where I heard commendations and recommendations. When you hear recommendations mean requirements, okay? Um, they're not really recommendations. Um, I'm thankful that to say that FBS got six commendations. 
And I was informed that the normal is like two to three. So I took encouragement with that. But who knows? They probably say that to all their paying customers. You know, you know how this goes. No, I'm joking a little bit. We received seven ways that we need to improve. And we're going to get to work on those seven ways. And the next year, 2024, we will hear if we have received a 10-year accreditation renewal. I suspect that we will. There was nothing in those seven recommendations of improvement that cannot be implement, and implemented. And frankly, I wasn't surprised at some of them as well. So I invite you to thank the Lord with me for his good favor. And thank you, Faith Church, for being a a uh, church that uh, uh, has something like Faith Bible Seminary to train men and, and women for vocational type ministry in our two programs that we have. But I want you to think about this. My assurance after the testing process, the moment I sat with them and they gave me these commendations, my assurance was bolstered that FBS had been tested and FBS is on the right track. But folks, there's something much, much more important to be shown as authentic and real than Faith Bible Seminary. What is that? What is that? Say me. No, you guys didn't say that. My son said it. Say me. Say me. Me. My faith. My faith. In one limited sense, Christianity can be attractive to the masses. Here's what I'm, I know you say with the cultural wars right now, you say, what are you talking about? Well, let me, in one limited sense, Christianity can be attracted to the masses because Christianity is different than every other religion in this way. You mean I don't have to perform in order to get to heaven? Say no. You mean I don't have to appease an angry God in order to get to heaven? Say no. You mean I don't have to do penance to get to heaven? Say no. But you do have to have genuine faith. And that faith that maybe you once easily prayed in a sinner's prayer, hear me, will be tested. We should not be surprised when the heavenly accreditation team comes to see if you are the real deal. With those thoughts in mind, please turn to 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 19. So on page 182 in the back section of the Bible in the chair in front of you, we are continuing our series this morning on hope for everyday life, a study of 1 Peter. This morning we are discussing, yes, this <laughs> hope because, yeah, of the testing of God. Starting in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12, hear God's word. Beloved, do not be surprised. When I was preaching earlier this year, I had you repeat after me these words. I will not be surprised. Say it again. I will not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing. The Greek word there is purosis, purifying. But we're trans the, the translators translated that as testing. Okay. It is a burning process. It goes along with the previous fiery ordeal. As though some strange thing were happening to you. This should not be surprising to us. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing so that also at the revelation of his glory, when he comes, you may rejoice with exultation also. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, say name of Christ. This is not because you're Republican or Democrat or independent. It's not because you're reviled for something other than Christ. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed. Because that's telling us something. You're functioning in a way as a Christ follower. It's likely that the spirit of the glory, the spirit of glory and the spirit of God rests upon you. In contrast, make sure that none of you suffer in your sufferings as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, a troublesome meddler, a busybody. Okay. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, in that way, you're not to be ashamed. But if you suffer as a Christian, you are to glorify God in that name, not Republican, Democrat, whatever organization or business you're part of. The next phrase is kind of is loaded for it is time for judgment to begin 
with the household of God. The fiery trials to begin with God's household. And if those fiery trials begin with us first, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? The the rhetorical question is, the answer is thus, they will be consumed by the fire and cannot stand it. And if it with and if it is with or through or by means of difficulty that the righteous are saved through the difficulty, through the fiery process, what will become of the godless man and the sinner? That's also a rhetorical question. The answer is they will be consumed. Therefore, those also who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. This morning, we're developing four natural expectations. If you, if you claim to be a child of God this morning, hear me on this. You should expect this. Okay? You shouldn't be surprised at this. So some strange thing is happening. Let me ask you a question this morning. Did you expect the sunrise this morning? Did you expect it? You didn't even think about it. You didn't even think about it. You did not wake up and say, oh my goodness, would you look at that? There's light outside and there's the sun. I'm shocked. Are you expecting it to be dark tonight? Folks, you should expect what I'm about to say to you just as natural as the sun rises and the sunset. This is part of God's economy. This will happen to you. And this is the way that it is as sure as the sun rising and the sun setting. The first natural thing, the expectation that you should anticipate is this. God will bring testing of his children. Say, I expect testing. God's testing is an expected part of life. Do not be surprised, surprised to cause a strong psychological reaction. Those, the introduction of something new or strange or astonished. You're shocked as if some kind of a hostile force has invaded us when we suffer in some way. That surprise causes us to spend all kinds of time in self-pity or anger or despair about how a particular circumstance has happened to me. And every moment spent in self-pity or anger and despair because of my circumstance is a moment wasted in what God is using the test for. It's kind of like this. You know, imagine those school days where you have a test and, you know, you have an hour to do the test. You knew it was coming, or maybe you didn't know, if, depending on how good of a student you were. But a test was coming, and the teacher gives you the test, and you have an hour to do it. And you spend the first 55 minutes w- lamenting that you have a test. You know you're going to fail it at that point if you only leave yourself five minutes. God commands, don't be surprised. Why? Why? God has made testing something embedded in the fabric of his world. Oh, friends, faith friends, you know this to be true. Okay? All of you, all of you expect test- testing in every other context, except when it comes to myself. You expect testing. Let me show you. For example, right now you're sitting in this building with 1986 building codes, codes applied to it. Um, You want this building to have been tested so that to have met the standards of occupation so the roof doesn't collapse on your head this morning. An unimaginable number, 60,000 people, died in the Syrian-Turkey earthquake this past year. 60,000. Imagine all of Purdue students and then some being wiped out. Of course, it was a severe earthquake, but in part, in part... The magnitude of death was, again, I say in part because of poor, untested construction. Of course, you want testing and you want refining. You want that. What do you want for your engineers? Say testing. What do you want for your doctors? What do you want for your airline pilots? What do you want for your pastors? You want, to, you want me to be the real deal. What do you want for your educational institutions like Faith Bible Seminary? What do you want? What do you want for yourself? <laughs> there's, where you, there's where we're shocked and surprised, hemming and hawing. If you say, no, thank you, you're forfeiting something beautiful in your life that God is working. And can I say you should have no assurance 
We'll talk about that in a little bit. As a Christian, specifically testing is what God has designed for his people specifically. When he says these words, time for judgment, I know that's a loaded word, time for judgment to begin with the household of God. Where does it begin, friends? Where does it begin? The house of God. Is Peter saying, by using this word judgment, that the suffering that we're experiencing is a divine penalty because of our sin? He can't be. Throughout this letter that he has written to those experiencing the trials, the unjust suffering, Peter has over and over been saying, suffering for righteousness. So Peter is using the term judgment here, not for God executing some kind of judicial sentence here because of one specific sin that you have. But he's using it in terms of rendering a decision, bringing about circumstances that reveal the nature of your faith, judging in that way. The judging activity of God here that we should expect is the activity of God that shows forth the practicing nature of your profession of Christ. The activity of God here, the, the judging aspect that begins with the household of God. It's the activity of God that destroys the useless, weak, and hindering parts of his children that have no place in God's kingdom. The judging activity of God here is the activity of God that polishes and purifies what God finds precious and most valuable. We've had that sermon before because I preached it regarding 1 Peter. Peter is saying that God is bringing about circumstances to burn away purosis, fiery trials, all that is weak and strengthening all that can stand the fire, all the while showing forth who are genuinely his first, say first. And we can see this as God's inherent design from the very first book of the Bible. Genesis 22, 1. Now it came about after these things that God, say the word, tested Abraham. The test for Abraham was whether his faith would bridge the gap between two seemingly impossible realities. And if it would, it would make Abraham and God's plan the foundation of redemption for the entire world to, br to bring a blessing to the entire world. The first seemingly impossible reality is that God had promised to give childless Abraham and dead womb Sarah a son through whom God would bring about blessing to the entire world. And God did bring about that son. Secondly, the seemingly impossible test here was that God imme God, God's immediate command in Genesis chapter 22, oh, Abraham, take that son that I promised you, that son that you love, your first, your only son, your unique son. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to sacrifice him. How could that be? God, you told me this was the son of the promise, and now you're asking me to kill him. How can this be? Abraham had faced many tests along the way, but the narrative arc of Genesis presents that Genesis 22, with Isaac sacrifice, this would be the ultimate test. In all the other times that God had tested Abraham, you might say, well, he was surprised and he was shocked at the testing. And he somehow tried to rationalize or justify or get around the promise in his own way. And he struggled deeply on his journey to a refined, pure faith. But now in Genesis chapter 22, after God gave the command to sacrifice Isaac, the text says this. And Abraham rose early in the morning and he saddled his donkey. No justification, no rationalization, no trying to get around it. No surprise, no shock. As you read the Genesis 22 account, it's a tender account, but it is a tense account. You see Abraham passing the test. And God showed forth to the world and to Abraham himself 
the refined nature of Abraham's faith. And at that very moment, the text records the promise of redemption to the world through the seed of Abraham was sealed. Light, hope, and assurance to, for this dark world came through Abraham being the real deal. However, that doesn't mean that the test for Abraham was easy. Again, if you read the account, you'll see the, the heartstrings being tugged when God says, take your son, not just your son, your unique son. And he adds this, the son that you love. Oh, it was heart-wrenching. Peter describes each test as a fiery ordeal. Faith friends, what does fire do? What does fire do? Oh yeah, you answered it. It burns. That burning hurts and there's no doubt about it. But the burning purifies as well. In fire, all that is not able to stand up to the burning is left in ashes, worthless to be blown away, showing us that what was burned was ultimately not able to be, is not worth anything. Friends, when the non-surprising fiery ordeals come to your life, you will find that the earthly riches cannot stand the fire. You will find out that the fame and fortune that we clamor for will be ashes. You will find out that the fleeting pleasures of this world that we tend to entertain ourselves with will be blown away. I'm going to say this next one, and I know it's going to be hard. Some of you have lost loved ones even recently. But if your trust, if your faith is in a relationship that you love, Isaac, Abraham, if your trust is in a relationship, you're, you're looking toward that ideal human relationship or romance that you have built in your mind, or actually you did build it up on this earth. Even if your spouse or your friend is loyal all of your life and it was a precious relationship, you know, the fire of death will render that person ashes, dust to dust. When the fire comes, the only thing that is left is what is precious. And that leads us here to the second natural expectation. Here it is. God will sift and refine his children's true allegiances. First Peter, if you are reviled, in the name of Christ, not in any other name, not in any other sports organization or political affiliation or business enterprise. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory rests upon you. Make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or a busybody. But if anyone suffers, here it is, as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed Implying that suffering otherwise, and maybe one of those other ways, shame involved there. But if you suffer as a Christian, oh, you're to glorify God in this name of Christianity. For this message here at this point, let me speak to those who profess the name Christ. You call yourself a Christian. Okay, I'm talking to you at this moment in time. The primary testing or suffering that is revealing in our lives. I was thinking this morning as I was preparing that, that preposition in could probably also be rendered of, re revealing of our lives is because of a specific identity that we claim. You're reviled in the name of Christ or for the name of Christ, suffers as a Christian, glorify God in his name. Your professed identity as a Christian in the name of Christ will be tested. So faith friend, you claim you are a Christian. You bear the name of Christ. What and where are your loyalties? You know this. This is not surprising. There are real Christians, and there are individuals who claim to be Christians that will not stand the fire. One of the most scary passages as a youth growing up in church, Matthew chapter 7, struggled with this for a while in my youth. 
Matthew 7, 21 through 23, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my father. There is the proof. Okay, so there's an outward proof there. Okay, who does the will of my father who is in, in heaven. He will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then he will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who, whose practice did not match the profession. You who do lawlessness. Your identity and faith in Christ will be tested. Friends, I want you to recognize that God is not so concerned about your engineering skills needed to build good buildings, although I'm thankful the one that who, who built this one. But he will test, God will test how you function as a Christian in your engineering profession. Do you bear the name of Christ and do you work with Christ-like values? Doctors, God is not so concerned that you have wisdom to diagnose everything out there. But do you have the wisdom to appropriately love those who God gave, brings your way? Factory worker, God is not so concerned that you have the ability to be the fastest assembly line person. But do you bear the name of Christ and function like Christ would on that assembly line? So I can go down through the list. Christian husband, are you loving like Christ? Christian parent, Christian school teacher, I will apply it to myself, Christian pastor. Okay. Please notice that the suffering, the suffering because of natural consequence or sinful choices, murderer, thief, evildoer, busybody, it's instructive. When we, when we have consequences because of our own sin, of course it is instructive, but it doesn't reveal your professed identity. You understand that? God is saving you to be something different. Notice what Peter says. Do not be ashamed if you suffer as a Christian. The implication. If you suffer as a murderer, thief, evildoer, troublesome meddler, and you experience difficult consequences for that, you should be rightly ashamed. Peter has been saying this all along. Remember these words? We've preached on them previously. For what credit is there? when you sin and are harshly treated and you endure it with patience. That doesn't reveal your identity. That doesn't be a blessing to others. 1 Peter 3, 17. For it is better if God should will it so that you suffer for doing what is right than for what is doing wrong. That kind of suffering for our sin, again, while instructive and helpful to us, is not revealing of what God calls us to be. All of that will be burned up in the fire. So let's ask the question, what is real tested faith? Suffering in his name. And let's start here with this. Most of you here, thank the Lord, bear the name of Christ. And that means you identify with him and that includes your identity on the cross, dying as we talked about a while back ago. In my sermon on hope for true life, true spiritual life a few weeks back before Easter, on that particular difficult passage of in 1 Peter chapter 3, I explain the following. Believers who are facing unjust suffering are to look to the example of Christ who amidst unjust suffering died in the flesh. That was his body. He physically died. But that wasn't all. He died to the world of the flesh, meaning all that the world values, that picture that is dead on the cross as well, never to be raised to new life again. And Jesus was raised to new life and to a new value system. So also you, you are to die to your natural responses during unjust suffering to bring forth true, supernatural, spiritual life. So what does true faith look like? And because I'm the pastor right now talking to the household of God, I will start with me. If I call myself a Christian CEO of a Christian organization like FBS, okay? If I call myself that, that is undergoing a testing. And by the way, nobody can call accreditation unjust suffering. Okay? I paid for this, right? I paid for the team to come and visit us and put their standard on us. 
But if I call myself a Christian CEO of a Christian organization like FBS that is undergoing testing, true faith has to, rec has to be something like this. I died with Christ to hiding FBS's weaknesses, to putting forth a false image, and I raised to walk in. I invite the scrutiny because I believe this is righteous and the will of God to strengthen us. Okay? If I call myself a Christian student and the professor mocks my faith in front of the class, I resist the temptation to slander the professor and gossip on social media, and perhaps I invite him over to learn about him, to try to be a blessing to him. If I call myself a Christian spouse, I resist the temptation to focus on my spouse's faults, but I ensure that I handle mine, genuine faith. If I call myself a Christian parent, I die to the lust to parent by convenience through scolding and anger. And my faith comes out in shepherding my child's heart in truth spoken in love. If I call myself a Christian friend and I'm sinned against, oh my, true faith, just like Christ, has to issue a willingness to forgive. If I call myself a Christian church member and I have a concern about this weakness in this church, I die to the temptation to gossip and complain and get others on my side and I get about the business of communicating what I see as a weakness and then I get about the business also of strengthening the body of which I'm a part. I claim to be a Christian church member here. Let me just go to the bare, bare bottom line. If I call myself a Christian, then faith comes out in learning more and more about Christ. You're here on a regular basis. You're studying the Word of God and finding your delight more and more in it over time. You're a part of the church body, so you're stimulating one another to know this Christ whom you profess that you follow. Milton Vincent's Gospel Primer is life-giving reflection on the Gospel to me, oftentimes. Milton Vincent's exhortation. Notice his exhortation and what we believers should expect. Here's what he said we should expect. I should expect every day to encounter, say every day, say every day, every day to encounter circumstantial evidence of God's commitment to me dying. There is the fiery trial right there. And I must seize upon every God-given opportunity to be more conformed more fully to Christ's death, no matter the pain involved. Milton Vincent is not talking about all this in terms of unjust suffering, but in context of 1 Peter here, we can add in unjust suffering to the context. When my flesh yearns for some prohibited thing, like Brent trying to escape the accreditors, <laughs> I must die. When called to do something I don't want to do in unjust suffering, I must die. When I wish to be selfish and serve no one, I must die. When shattered by hardships that I despise, I must die. When wanting to cling to wrongs done to me, I must die. He goes on. When enticed by allurements of the world to just escape the suffering, I must die. When wishing to keep besetting sin secret, I must die. When once that our borderline needs are left unmet, I must die. When dreams that are good seem shoved aside, I'm, I'm losing the American dream. I must die. Not my will, but yours be done. Christ trustingly prayed on the eve of his crucifixion and preaching his story to myself. Preaching the gospel to me every day puts me in a frame of mind to trust God, set my face to the flint. Okay. to expect every day God's commitment to me dying and bringing forth new life in me. Third, when this is true and you're doing this, you can expect God's life of faith growing in you. God's life of faith growing in his children is part of your blessed assurance. It's not all, but it's part of your blessed assurance. Throughout his letter, Peter has been saying some of the most paradoxical things about suffering, testing, and trials, and he continues that in our passage. Rejoice because 
at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exaltation. Why? Because you'll be there as a child refined in your faith. You will be there. You are blessed. And this, you're reviled for the name of Christ. Your faith has worked itself out and you're suffering because of it. Oh, friend, guess what? There's evidence. The spirit of his glory of, and of God rests upon you. You're different. Something about seizing the trial, dying to the old man, bringing forth the new way of life shows something. As your faith is purified, refined, and put on display, Peter says the spirit of God rests upon you. There is part of your blessed assurance that Jesus is yours. You know, after the accreditation thing, this is not a perfect example, but I started with it that Friday morning after I got the six commendations and I saw that the seven recommendations were all doable, would not prevent us from our 10-year accreditation. My assurance, I knew that FBS was the real deal on the right track. Let me illustrate this point in a negative way. I'll never forget the time when an individual that I had the privilege of counseling came to me, and this young man was not a member of our church. You most likely don't know him. I'm not saying his name. But he was a professing believer. He came to me with doubts about the Bible and Christianity. At first, I entertained his questions about supposed Bible contradictions and creation evolution and the so-called problem of evil out there. So we spent time on that. Then eventually I asked him about his personal walk with God and I found out that he was sleeping with his girlfriend. I began to challenge him on this. I'm moving away from all the doubts about Christianity and trying to show that Christianity is a compelling and consistent and comprehensive worldview. That really probably wasn't the issue. I began to challenge him on his walk with Christ. He stopped sleeping with his girlfriend. And strangely enough, I noticed that his questions about assurance doubts evaporated. I suppose it's not terribly strange. Until one day he came to me and I said, and he said, um, I'm struggling with my doubts again. This time I did not go into Christian apologetics. I went straight to what I suspected. I said, are you sleeping with your girlfriend again? And he said, yes. And I said, it's no wonder you're struggling. I've had, had, I've had the occasion to watch the arc of this man's life, and as God has continually tested him, tested him, tested him, he has suffered as an evildoer and not as a Christian. I ultimately don't know if he is a Christian, but he had struggled with assurance. This morning, if you profess to be a follower of Christ, but test after test shows you never follow Christ, I would invite you to ask the question, does the spirit of God's glory rest upon me? Now, let me talk to the majority of you here at Faith Church. I know that test after test after test, God is refining you and you are the real deal. Thank you, Faith Church members. It's so blessed to be a part of a church that has so many real deal people around. Thank you for allowing God's spirit to work in your life that way. Fourthly and finally, expect this. God will do what is right through the testing. God will do what is right through the testing. Therefore, those who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing, oh, he will do what is right. The faithful creator doing what is right in the testing is illustrated ultimately by the example of Jesus Christ. Friends, let's think about the phrase, the household of God, for just a moment, the household of God, a part of the phrase judgment or decisions about the reality of your faith begin with the household of God. Question here for you, those of you who may know the Bible, in the Old Testament, what was the household of God? What was the household of God in the Old Testament? Oh yeah, I heard it. Temple, temple, tabernacle. Many of the Old Testament individuals came to put their trust in that system of sacrifices, in that physical building, instead of the God of that building. In essence, their faith, faith was resting in something fallible that could not stand the fires of testing. There was, an old, there was a time in Old Testament redemptive history where that temple and the city of Jerusalem were thought to be unbreachable, impenetrable, and would never fail. 
but because of the people's idolatry and their manipulation of that system and their trust in something other than God, God sent the fires of testing upon Jerusalem and that household of God, that temple of God. Do you know what happened to that temple, the household of God? What happened to that household of God in the Old Testament? Oh, it burned. It burned. Eventually, God permitted the temple in the city to be rebuilt. And eventually, the people started doing the exact same thing. To put their trust in this new temple and city. Do you know what happened to that new temple and city? It burned too. In AD 70, probably a decade after Peter is writing this particular letter. Remember where Peter is right now, the heart of Rome. Rome set fire to the city and that household of God was destroyed. Here's a question. Is there any household of God that's going to not be consumed by the fire of God's testing? Who can stand? Who can stand? Is there any hope for the people of God to not be reduced to ashes but come forth as gold? Is there any hope? Is there any hope? (laughs) Peter makes an astounding statement earlier that we have studied regarding the household of God. And coming to him, Jesus Christ, as to a living stone which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God. You also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For this is contained in scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion, a new Jerusalem, a new city, the city of God, okay? A choice stone, the cornerstone. Who is this? Say his name, say his name. Precious cornerstone and he who believes in him will not be disappointed or in the metaphor that we're using now will not be consumed. This precious value is for you who believe genuinely. So is there any hope for the people of God to not be reduced to ashes but come forth as gold? The answer is absolutely yes. The text says you will not be disappointed. Why? You understand If you are part of the true household of God, your household has a foundation that has been tested. You understand that we have a forerunner. The word of God became flesh and he tabernacled among us. He was the household of God. And that forerunner, Jesus Christ is his name, went through the fires of testing. And that household of God was tested for its ability to stand. And when God tested that household, the foundation of what he's building in the household of God today, when God tested him, was he ultimately and finally consumed? Say no. Was he ultimately reduced to ashes? Say no. Was he ultimately found out to be not the real deal? Say no. Jesus Christ survived the testing. God did the right thing by vindicating him in front of everyone and saying, this is the real deal. And he raised him from the dead. The house of God went through the most rigorous judging, testing, and came forth as gold. His name is Jesus Christ, the cornerstone. And that one is committed to doing right by you in your testing. Oh, friends, you won't be disappointed. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ, he was the only one who have ever faced the fires of God and survived them. If you're trusting in something this morning for your hope in this life, friends, it will burn. You will be consumed. You will be. Just as sure as the sun rises and sets, your only hope is to to latch yourself to the one who withstood the fires of God and came out on the other side tested. Believers, okay, expect the testing. If you call yourself a child of God, expect the testing. Expect the refining of your allegiances as you bear the name of Christ. Know that this is part of your blessed assurance of your identity. And God promises you, you will not be disappointed. In fact, you will rejoice with joy inexpressible as you are shown forth 
now and forever as the real deal in Christ. Rejoice. Let's pray. Oh, Father, thank you for not leaving us in the dark without a word of revelation telling about how you operate. Father, thank you for Jesus Christ, the one who survived the testing. And those who are with him, he will bring forth through the fire all the way home. Help us to set our faces to these things that you bring into our lives, to refine us, to purify us, and to show forth our faith for the blessing of others, the blessing of our own soul, and for your glory. In Christ's name, amen.